I'm really excited about this uh, new series that we are starting today, Dream Big, uh, in small places and in small churches. Um, I just want to make a couple of comments before I pray for the message and share some thoughts on God's Word today. Uh, I shared with the council, I, I feel that you guys asked me here for a specific reason and to share a little bit about the transition, share a little bit about the church and bring encouragement and hope. And that is my intention. Um, obviously, we are, like I prayed about, we're living in a world with a lot of civil unrest, um, racial concerns, and uh, having a very diverse family myself, I would love to be talking about some of those issues. and. I do not feel, though, that this is the time to be talking about these issues. I want to talk about us as a church family and where we're going in the future. And so, if you have concerns or you want to listen to some messages, i got some great friends that I can show you where you can listen to some of their messages on racial issues today. The second thing that I just want to share about this series, um, right now, um, I'm probably getting oh, way over-educated for how God has wired me, but I'm shared before I'm working on my doctorate, and I'm getting a doctorate in small towns and rural areas. And what's very interesting is I have to read a lot of books. And so this series is going to be based upon a lot of the information that I am learning that I'm going to share with us. I just think it's going to be very helpful to us as a church family. And the last thing I just want to say, if you start seeing this and you're saying, well, this, this doesn't apply to church. This applies to me as well. I've done my job because this information I'm going to be sharing works exactly in your own family, you as an individual Christ follower, and I hope that you'll see that this morning. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask that he will speak to us today. Father. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the truth of God. And I pray, dear Lord, that you'll bless us as we study your word today. And I just pray that the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart will be pleasing in your sight. For you are a rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I played college basketball, let me say that again. When I sat on the bench on the college basketball team, uh, one time we were playing uh, Tri-State, which I don't think it's called Tri-State anymore. I think it's called Tri-University. But we were playing Tri-State. And we brought our team and our team at Taylor University, we had cheerleaders. And so they would travel with us as we were playing games. And Tri-State used to be sort of one of our rivals and we were playing them. And as the game was going on, we started to break out in a cheer. And I don't know if, you're, if they still do this at basketball games in, in Indiana or not, but they started chanting, we've got spirit, yes we do, we've got spirit, how about you? Are you familiar with that? And then so the Taylor side started getting in, they'd get louder, we got spirit, yes we do, we got spirit, how about you? And then they, they would start yelling, we got spirit, yes we do, we got more spirit, you know, they're gone. And then eventually the Taylor side said, but we have girls, we have girls. <laughs> and... If you're laughing at that time, Tri-State was mainly just a boys, or mainly boys were just going to Tri-State, and so it was fun. <laughs> Today's message, though, is we got spirit. Yes, we do. And we need to understand we have the Holy Spirit in us as Christ followers. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you believe in him, the Bible says that you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. You've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is the power that lives inside of us. But we need to understand, regardless of whether we live in a small place or a small church, we have the Holy Spirit as well as a church. And he's available to us. I want to start off with a scripture passage. Um, and it will be on the screen. Hopefully you can see that and read it. It's from the book of Ephesians. And I read it earlier to you this morning. Notice this word. It says, Now to him who is able to do far more. We, when we pray, we're praying to a God. 
God who is able to do far more than what we ask or think. According to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I don't know if you can tell or not, but there are three specific words in this context and just these short verses that center in on power. In the Greek, it's a word like dynamite that we get dynamite from and the word we get actually energy from. And so Paul is praying a prayer and saying, you have more energy, you have more power within you than you think. And God wants us to understand that within our church, there is more power and energy, things that are working inside of us that we don't even realize individually and collectively. So here's the first point I want us to understand. If we want to dream big, we need to understand this. How we pray determines the capacity of our call. How we pray. I don't know about you, but I've always struggled with my prayer life. I just grew up a good old Lutheran boy. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray my soul to keep, bless mommy and daddy, Julie and Chris, grandma and grandpa, amen. Come Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let thy gifts to us be blessed, amen. Simple prayers, we went to church, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, you know? Those were the simple prayers, and I prayed them often. And as I got older and maybe moved a little bit away from the Lutheran tradition, I learned to pray prayers, and we got fancy and added in Jesus' name at the end of them, thinking that they were more powerful because I added in Jesus' name. But still, sometimes, my own prayer life was lacking. And what we need to understand is how we pray determines the capacity, the ability, the work that God has to work in our lives. It was very interesting. Um, I was listening to Robbie Zacharias, who just passed away. He, he's a great... He was a great man, theologian, a debater. And he was talking in this talk, and he was talking about a young man who came up to him and talked about following Christ. And he, he, he told Robbie, that Christ, and he was like, my mom's prayers, your teachings, and the word of God changed my life. And the mom was standing a little bit beyond him. And then the mom came up and she had tears in his eye, her eyes and she just says, thank you. you. You played an important role in my son's life and him following Jesus Christ. And he said, wait a second. The first thing that he mentioned was his mother's prayers. And he said, don't overlook. Your prayers made a difference. As a Christian, and as a pastor, God works through our prayer life. And if you want to see God work in your own individual life, in your family life, in your church life, we need to pray. We need to pray. And one of the things we've been learning on Tuesday night Bible studies is, is that in, in Ephesians, there's two prayers. And their prayer is not the kind of prayers we pray. Organ prayers, you know what organ prayers are? <laughs> we pray for every part of your physical organ that is breaking down. That, that, that's how we usually pray. But Paul is saying we need to pray. We need to not just pray. We need to really, really, really pray. We need to get down on our knees and beg God to unleash his power in our lives. So how we pray determines the capacity of our calling. The second thing that I learned in this passage is how we think, how we think determines the calling or the clarity of our calling in our life. So it says that he is able to do far beyond what we can ever ask. That's our prayer life. 
or think. Later it goes on and actually talks about dreams. That's how I want us to dream big. But what are you thinking about on a daily basis? I know, and you know this, right? If in your own life, if you're thinking negatively about yourself, there's going to be negative behaviors. You've probably heard this. You say, oh, so, so and so, they got a low self image. What does that mean? Well, they think negatively about themselves, or they think lowly about themselves. Well, we as a church, we can get in that habit as well. We, we can start to develop negative thoughts about our church. Oh, we're just an older church, and we don't, we don't have a youth ministry anymore, we don't have a children's ministry anymore, or, or our, our worship doesn't compete with other larger churches, or whatever the thoughts go through your mind, or we don't have the finances like we used to have, or we don't have as many people as attending as before, and you start having these thoughts upon thoughts upon thoughts, and soon they become more negative and more negative. And I'm not just giving you what uh, Norman Vincent Peale stuff here, the power of positive thinking. I want us to think biblically. I want us to think what God's Word says about us. Again, we've been going through the book of Ephesians. The first three chapters focus us in on our identity in Christ. Who we are in Christ. And who do you think about as yourself, as a Christ follower. When you're thinking about yourself, and if you're thinking about your identity, and if it's plugged into Jesus Christ, guess what? Your actions and your behaviors are going to follow. Tuesday night, we're going to start off in Ephesians 4.1. It says, therefore, based upon your calling, live worthy of your calling. Well, it depends what you're thinking about. And actually, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about our thoughts and maybe some of the perspectives we have of living in a small place and in a small church. Notice what the message says about this passage in Ephesians 3. It says, God can do anything. You know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. This is a paraphrase of this thing. God can do anything, you know, far more than we could ever imagine or guess in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us. His spirit deeply and gently within. And then it goes on, glory to God in the church, glory to God in the Messiah, in Jesus, glory down through all generations, glory through all millennia. Oh, yes. And I, I just want to highlight a couple of things here. Again, not only the power, but notice, God's not going to push you around as a church. And, and if you feel like, as your transitional pastor, I'm pushing you around, you're getting the wrong message, because I don't want to push you around. I want to stretch you. I want to develop you. I want to encourage you. I want to inspire you. But that's not how God works. God is very gracious and kind. The book of Romans says it is his compassion that leads us to repentance. Or it's his mercy that leads us. His kindness is what leads us to repentance. But notice, the glory is in the church. Somebody said this is the only place where the church comes before Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah. God wants to work in the church. So we need to dream big. So here's two more truths. So we, we learned about prayer. We learned about what we're thinking about. Here's the second truth. God can do anything by working within us. And we're going to see in just a little bit, it's this Holy Spirit that is the key. Do you remember right after the resurrection and still the disciples were a little scared and confused about what was going to happen? And they're waiting and they're thinking, Jesus Christ is going to establish his kingdom. And he says, no, 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 just go wait in Jerusalem. Just wait, wait for me because you shall be my witnesses when? 
When the power of the Holy Spirit, the same word for the, that we get the word dynamite from, but I sort of hate to mention that because I'm just trying to say that's the same word. The Holy Spirit, the power is going to work as we witness and go into Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the world. So it's his power working in us. God can do anything. Notice this. The bigger the dreams, the more his glory. That's why I want us to dream big. Do you realize God wants to be glorified in this church? He wants to be more glorified than you probably even think or imagine. God is jealous for his glory. God is hungry for his glory. And there's a time coming when Christ is going to come back and he's going to be glorified. God is constantly at work and he wants to be glorified. I just want to stop here for a second and ask you the question, when was the last time you dreamed big personally? When is the last time you dreamed big personally for your life? Dream big for your spouse, maybe. Dream big for your family. When is the last time you had big dreams for your children or your grandchildren? Or have you been caught in that trap? And again, I fall in it. Oh, nothing good will ever happen. God's, I think God's against me. God's not for me. God's not working in my life. Nothing's ever going to happen. Nothing's ever going to change. But I think we're going to see here very clearly as we go through this series, God wants us to dream big because he's a big God and he has a big spirit working within us. I want us to just talk a little bit about small places and small churches and you can see these statistics on the screen here. But this may be something you've never even thought about. Notice this, 95% of churches in the United States are under 500 in size. Did you see that? 95% of churches. And I think sometimes, so we watch Charles Stanley or David Jeremiah, or maybe you see Chuck Smidall or Charles Stanley's son, Andy Stanley, or we watch on YouTube and we see all these churches or we go to these conferences and we're like, wow, there's so many large churches. But 95% of churches are 500 or less. They just don't get talked about. The vast majority of churches in America are, are, are really under 100 in size. Probably 80 to 85% of churches in America are 100 or 100 in size. The vast majority of pastors will never pastor a church larger than 150 in size. Why am I saying these statistics to you? Because I want you to understand Sometimes we don't dream big for what God wants to do because we develop a false notion that only the big church or the big name pastors matter. God has a lot to say in small places and in small churches through humble congregations Amen. and humble pastors. And we need to understand that and we need to trust that God is working in that way. Notice here are some other statistics. The early church, you may never forget, the early church started in the home. And we're going to look at some of these passages later. But the early church started in home churches. The average New Testament church met in homes, in upper rooms and courtyards. This past fall, I had the privilege of going to Israel. I got to go to Jerusalem. I got to go to some of the places around the Sea of Galilee. And I got, to see, I got to see where Peter's home was. <laughs> it was pretty cool to see where Peter's home was. But to see where the first church probably gathered, it was not much bigger than this. It was just different. It was in a circle. And they gathered in a circle. And most of the synagogues, they were very small in these towns. We need to understand that that's how it started. I got to, to go and what many believe was the upper room and um, sadly now it's, it's, a, it's a place where Muslims have bought it I think um, but I got to go in that upper room the upper room isn't much bigger than this, in fact I would say it's much smaller than this location as well churches historically
historians describe the average church size at roughly 75, which is roughly the average church in America today. Now, why am I sharing these statistics? I'm sharing these statistics because instead of beating ourselves up, maybe, for being a small church or living in a small place, we need to understand we may actually be in the ideal of what God wants to do. Especially as it relates to revival and restoration and in what God wants to do through the church in the United States today. So here's what we want to do in this series. We want to dream big. We want to exploit smallness. Now that may sound a funny way to say it. We want to exploit smallness. So we want to capitalize on it. We want to benefit from it. And I was trying to get the right word. And so I was looking at some different phrases for this word exploit. And milk it is one of them. I was like, again, I've never milked a cow. I've never milked a cow before. I've watched people milk a cow. But milking it, here's my impression of milking a cow. You're, you're trying to get everything possible out of it, right? And trying to do it so you can produce the milk that is needed. And if I totally butcher that, which is that the right phrase to say? But I don't know. <laughs> but if I totally messed up that illustration, <laughs> I hope you understand what I'm talking about. We need to exploit smallness. And one of the things we're going to talk about, the advantages of being small. Just out of curiosity, a couple of people want to throw out, what's some of the advantages of being small? You know everybody. You know everybody. Another example. It's, it's usually friendly because you know everybody and you know you're going to see them again, right? So you better be friendly with them. Another one? How about one more? They're genuine. Genuine. Usually genuine. In which, by the way, this is why I like to speak out in front, not hide behind anything. I want to be real and transparent because that is important in a small town and in a small church. So let's talk about milking it. Small churches do have advantages. Small churches do have advantages. Let's move on a couple of slides. I want to look at Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. And I would encourage you to go back. Actually, this morning, I want you to know, you can actually listen to Zechariah. The whole chapter, or the whole book of Zechariah is 14 chapters. You can do it in about 20 minutes just listening to it on your phone. But I reread the book of Zechariah. Zechariah, in a nutshell, the people were in captivity for 70 years. And God's saying, I still have a plan for my people, the Israelites, in Jerusalem. And I'm going to restore it, and I'm going to build the, the temple. But he's saying, I'm going to do it my way. And you need to trust me. But notice here in Zechariah, this is probably a verse that many of us have heard before. Notice what he says. He says, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord's host. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. And he shall bring forward the top Stone and shouts of grace, grace to it. Then he said, this is God's message. I'm going to read another paraphrase here. This is God's message to Rubble. You can't force these things. They only come through by my spirit, says the God of angel armies. So big mountain, who do you think you are? Next to Zerubbabel, you are nothing but a molehill. He'll proceed to set the cornerstone in place, accompanied by cheers. Yes, yes, do it. Here's the last two points that I want us to just chew on. Size doesn't matter. Size does not matter, but the Spirit of God matters. In this passage, some of the people are confused because Jerusalem isn't what it used to be. It was destroyed by the Babylonians. The whole temple had been destroyed. And they went to go back to rebuild the temple, and then they weren't able to build it in all of its glory as before. And some people were, some 
past leaders and priests that were crying about what had happened to Jerusalem. And what God is telling through the voice of Zechariah and to Zerubbabel and to the leaders is that what matters is not the size but the Holy Spirit. It's very interesting. I, I didn't know whether to put Ephesians first or Zechariah first. But the power and the might that we talk about in Ephesians is the power and the might of the Holy Spirit. And that is the joy of being a church today, the joy of being a Christian today, that we have the power of the Holy Spirit. And the second truth is this, God's grace eliminates the mouth. So tonight, for example, if you come back for the transition team meeting, or if over through this series you hear me talking and sort of saying, well, you guys just need to sort of suck it up by the bootstraps. And you guys just need to work hard. You need to be determined. You need to get your act together and all that. And that's not what's going to allow our church to be healthy. What's going to be healthy is God's grace. God's grace, God's grace, God's grace. And you notice that the end people started shouting, grace, grace, yes, yes, this is where it's at. And again, as an individual follower of Jesus Christ, it's not what you do on your own and through your thoughts and your ideas. And yes, God can work through your thoughts and ideas, but the way God works is through the Holy Spirit and by His grace. You have been saved by grace, but you have also, you're being transformed and renewed by grace. So here's what I want us to think about as our next step. One, are you going to be open to God's grace? In your own life, in your family's life, in this church's life, I think the, the whole idea about being able to dream big is, are you open to God's grace? Because if you think it's just going to be you, you're in your trouble. And the second thing is, are you willing to pray for God to move mountains. And that, I didn't talk a lot about the mountain. The mountain, you may be saying, is the size of our church or our community or maybe our economic status or who is left to serve and to volunteer and all those sort of things. Or maybe you're thinking the mountain is this pandemic and this is our new normal. A lot of churches are saying that. How are we going to move forward now with all the CDC and all the requirements, can we actually be the church? And did people get comfortable just watching church at home and don't feel comfortable coming back to church together? There's a lot of mountains out there. But just like God told Zerubbabel, I'm going to make that mountain disappear. It's going to turn into a molehill. We need to pray that God will remove the mountain in our own lives, in your family's life, and in this church life. Let us pray. Father, we just want to thank you for the word of God. We want to thank you for the truth of God. And I pray, dear Lord, that this morning I gave a message that provides hope and encouragement to these dear people. And I pray, dear Lord, that we will be open to your grace, grace upon grace, and may we be open to pray big dreams, not only for ourselves, but for this church. Allow us to do it through the power of your Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ. May you be glorified. And may you be glorified in this church. Amen. Please give a final benediction. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he grant you his countenance and his peace until we meet again. God bless you. Amen.